Hey, today is October 23rd, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast episode 63. Uh, today on Human Factors Cast, we're diving into the psychology of nudges. We're breaking down some of Adobe's announcements from last week, and we'll also be talking about the best exercises for your brain and more. You're going to need all the brain power you have because Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, you do a little jig because we're back. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorf. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed your time to do your little jig, but Nick, it's good to be back. Hey, it is good to be back. Blake, I know we usually banter, but I have to get into some things before we start. What you got, man? Okay, so I just want to thank all of our listeners who have joined us on Slack, and you can too. We have that link in the show notes for you, as well as on our website, on our SoundCloud, whatever. But I wanted to call attention to a couple things that were said in the Slack. So uh, first off, uh, Brian McD, uh, shortly after we posted last week, uh, Brian actually wrote to us and um, also gave us his thoughts on the HFES bonus episode. So thank you for that. Uh, we had uh, actually quite a few people join. So thank you, all of our new people. Um, I, we got quite a few. So the, the conversations are starting to flow and uh, it's, it's getting good. Um, so thank you all to those of you who joined up and joined in the discussion. We love having you. And then also, Eccentric Cog, uh, one of our users in our Slack channel, has a great retrospective from his perspective of HFES this year. So it's it's a little bit different from what I went through, and uh, it's always good to get those alternative perspectives. It is posted in our Slack, so if you if you want that link, uh, you gotta you gotta join up on Slack. It's like it's like we're holding it hostage. Um, I will say it's fairly. Did you have a chance to look over this, Blake? Honestly, Nick, I was sick last week, and I have really not had a chance to hop in and talk in our Slack since probably I interacted, I think, with Brian McD and you. Uh, so, no, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I saw all the messages today going back and forth between you guys, and it seems like it was a, a great retrospective of what went on and a little bit different from what you saw, correct? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the the first part's fairly the same. It talks about um, Ronald Davis's talk and, and all that, but, you know, there's, there's other sort of... Um, there's other things in there that I didn't cover, right? So uh, there's a presentation by Susan Ballow. I'm going to mess up the pronunciation on that um, about uh, NIST, which I'm not sure what that is. Do you know what that is? It's talking about forensics. Oh, uh, no, I'm not really familiar with NIST. I'm trying to look on his page here. Hang on. But anyway, like no. everybody, be sure to join the uh, Slack channel for sure. Check out some of it. Centric Cog work his retrospective on HAPS and also interact with other people like me, myself, and Nick, and also everybody else that's in the Slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we are definitely facilitating the conversation over here. There's been some questions. There's been some answers. It's it's a good time. So now's a good time to jump in. Okay, Blake, now it's time for the banter. How are you? <laughs> oh, man, I'm doing pretty good. I actually have a little bit of housekeeping in terms of some events that are coming up that I wanted to throw out there for part of my banter. Uh, so if you're in San Diego this week, October 25th through the 27th, be sure to come say hi because I'm going to be at Design Forward again here at San Diego at Point Loma. It's going to be a good time. There's a day full of talks, including talks from Don Norman, a lot of other heavy hitters, and then some user-centered design workshops that I'm not sure what those are yet, but if you happen to go to Design Forward or am listening to this podcast, please come say hi. Again, my name is Blake Arnsdorf, um, but also uh, last kind of <laughs> event promotion here. Um, for World Usability Day this year, I'm helping out with the User Experience Professional Association in LA, and it'll be on November 9th, all about inclusion and how we can hire better for our UX teams. Uh, we've got three pretty awesome speakers one's the president of vitamin t another one another one's the ux director from adp and then the founder of 
Wonder Women in Wonder Women Tech, I do believe it is, or Wonder Women in Tech. But anyway, it's uh, some great perspectives on what's going on in the LA's LA UX scene and kind of a little bit of help about how you can help yourself find a job. For sure. Uh, and and uh, you just reminded me one other thing. Uh, in our Slack, we actually have a calendar going. So if you have, if you guys, our listeners, have any events that are outside of our area of, uh, uh, our area of interest, which is Southern California. If you have any other events that maybe some of our other listeners or other human factors practitioners may be interested in, toss them in there and uh, let everybody know because we are trying to uh, facilitate a uh, a calendar that will uh, span not only the U.S. but worldwide. I mean, we have listeners all over the place. So, uh, I mean, we just we talked with someone from Germany this week, and uh, they didn't know that they had a local HFES meeting. So that's that's cool. Um, yeah, so jump in and, and do that and we'll put these events on the calendar as well. And, and so that way you can kind of keep up to date with where we're going and where everybody else is going and, and, uh, provide those networking opportunities. Okay, Blake. So I see, what is this? I I see on your banter here, adult swim, 52 (laughs) weeks of free music. Okay. So this is something that adult swim has done. I don't know for a really long time. I feel like I remember doing this in high school, but they typically, like allow so in somewhere in designing cartoons, they really got into the music scene, whether it's in Atlanta or it's uh, any kind of like companies de- or <laughs> any kind of labels down in the South. But they allow you to stream like a once once a week. They like throw up a new free set of music, kind of promoting artists and just getting making people aware of like what's out there. But what was really crazy is I actually saw this come up on my feed for web designer news is one of the most voted websites to go take a look at. And I have to say it was just a funny mashup because I don't know how familiar everybody in our audience or you, Nick, are are familiar with Adult Swim, but they're known for some pretty strange art design humor, those kind of things. And it was just a, it was a really cool mashup of those talents, right? Of kind of creating this weird art in a semi-functional design it was i wouldn't say that when i when i like sat down i was like i'm not really sure how to do anything here but it because it's it's like a major graphic in the middle of the screen um with some controls of course to like play or share the music you're listening to but how you like navigate through the playlist is definitely have to go and find it it's a it's kind of like a hidden ui element on the screen but anyway it's it was just a really cool intersection between kind of where user experience and des- and like just the design and art thing come together and can kind of diverge because I, I I always know that a lot of times Adult Swim is not necessarily trying to design the most functional thing, but maybe the cooler looking or the stranger looking in maybe this case. So it was just a really uh, really cool shout out for Adult Swim. Yeah, so I'm uh I'm on the website now. It's loading, so we might hear some music here. Oh, but- actually. That was one thing I wanted to point out and sorry to drop in there, Nick, but it was I had a really hard time getting it to actually work because it used something called WebGL that would not load through my particular Chrome browser. Actually, I had to use it through Firefox. So that was something I wanted to take off from them. Man, they could they could really. uh, okay, they could do cross platform for sure. I mean, yeah, it had to, it had something to do because it's intense animation, right? Course, yeah, it's really fan. intense. My my thing is lagging pretty bad. Yeah, so I mean that's why, <laughs> right? And it's it was one of those things that it even it gave you a disclaimer before. It's like we're using WebGL; it's going to make your stuff slow, and it's not available on all platforms. So uh, enjoy. I didn't uh, I didn't get that disclaimer. I wonder if that was because I am using an ad blocker. <laughs> Oh, probably. Well, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, so that was my kind of weird and fun user experience of the week. Well, hang on. I, I got it here on uh, Firefox. Let's see if we get some music. Anyway, so so that was your fun, weird. Well, I have a fun, weird thing, too. Uh, have you heard of this new South Park game? Yeah, okay. So this is funny, man, because the first time, like, I don't know, within the first week that you and I met each other, um, where you currently work and where I used to work, you were telling me about this game. And I saw, I think when I was walking through Target, I saw it actually on stands. I didn't realize it took that long to release. Yeah, it was delayed a couple times. But the, uh, so the title of this thing, okay, so I put this in our show notes for a couple reasons. One, it's an excuse to say butthole on the show. Uh, and two, I, there was a, there's, okay, first off, the, the game's name is South Park, The Fractured Butthole. But, 
whole two words, but obviously play on words. South Park, if you're familiar with the franchise, likes to play on that stuff. Anyway, I'm playing this game, and uh, no matter how you feel about the humor or whatever, this this game has sort of mastered this um, progression system. How many times have you played a game, Blake, where you're kind of in it, and then uh, you, you don't really know um, sort of what your progress is and... and uh, or I don't know. I I can't describe. I I'm not doing this thing justice. But base, basically, this thing has so many variables that like when you when you catch a microaggression or something, you can punch somebody, and every time you punch somebody, you get you get an extra point, right? And every time like um, every time you fart in combat, you get uh, I, it's crude and but but it always gives you the sense of progressing, right? And they they make the bars not unobtainable, right? Because you know the the scaling up factor on some of these um bar based progression like levels, right? Like you'll you'll get one level and then the next level will be that much further away, and then the following level will be such a jump. Like why not just a couple more experience points? Like set the curve at an appropriate level instead of anyway they do this great because you always feel like you're working towards something when you do upgrade something all the way you get a reward for it which is good because there's rewards for everything and most of the time it's superficial it's it's literally just costumes that you can use but i mean they really sort of nailed down what you know this this whole progression system it's it's pretty cool there's there's the sense of always one more i'm just going to do one more thing um and it it really gets you going yeah that's a, that's a cool i, I don't know it makes me want to try it out cuz i had a really hard time um with a lot of systems with progression right cuz i'm big into multiplayer of first person and third person shooters but it, in like Call of Duty and in Gears, at some points it gets really hard to know like what's gonna what it's gonna take for you to level up. If you're not playing on a double XP weekend of some kind, you're probably never gonna get there. And if you're a goofball like I always have been, like doing prestige levels, it's just it doesn't even make any sense. But it's cool that they've obviously figured out how to master this progression system because a, another recent game, and again, this is not me trying to attack anybody or anything but when i jumped in and di- and really had a hard time figuring out i talked about i think last week actually was jumping in in battle royale for um fortnite sorry, for fortnite yeah so i had a really tough time kind of figuring out what's going on how did all these systems interconnect what's progression look like so i mean it, this may be crude humor in it's south park but it sounds like they actually like most of the stuff they do on their show they put some serious effort into making sure it was I don't know, usable and enjoyable for people to play. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It, it, it surprised me for sure because, you know, you go in expecting the crude humor and to have it balanced out with this really elegant progression system was just kind of a a, a surprise. Uh, do you want to talk about this Blade Runner thing or should we push it to next week? It's your choice. Man, let's push it. We are we got heavy amount of stories. Let's get into it. All righty, you got it. So this, like Blake said, this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. Now, this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology. We got a little uh, potpourri today. Uh, so, Blake, why don't you go ahead and run us through it as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors. <laughs> I, I'm dyslexic tonight. Let's do it. Let, Blake, what do we got up first? It's all good, man. I got you. Okay, so last week, Richard Fowler, a scientist at the University of Chicago, won the Nobel Prize for his work in behavioral economics. Fowler demonstrated how how nudging, aka influencing how people, influencing people while fully maintaining their freedom of choice, may actually help people exercise better self-control in situations such as saving for a pension or in other context. Fowler has written a lot about this potent, massive potential for nudges to emphasizing the fact that these seemingly small interventions can actually steer people in a particular direction, but that it also allows them to go their own way if they so choose. Many skeptics have raised concerns that nudging may be akin to manipulation. However, Fowler is pretty staunch that his research shows that most people disagree and welcome nudges that help them make their lives better. Man, I so this is this is a pretty cool line of research, I have to say. I just can't help but laugh a little bit that he won the Nobel Prize for something that's called nudging. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then I mean the name, sure, but the concept here, and th- this is truly deeply engrossed in human factors because we try to subtly nudge 
our users um, into doing the right thing in terms of a usability perspective, right? And, oh, uh, most definitely, yeah. And this is this is kind of at the macro level. I mean, we talked a lot about policy when it came to Ronald Davis's talk on uh, police reform versus policing reform, and and I mean this th- this is a this is a uh, a good thing that people are sort of receptive to these subtle nudges if if it has their best interest in mind. Yeah, most definitely. And I mean, he he gives some really great examples that are all over the place. I mean, he talks about even how and I I think this was my favorite one because, okay, he talks a lot about some of the bigger ones out there. Right. Like like warning labels on cigarettes that tell you they do cause cancer or even what the calories and breakdown of food you eat is. I mean, it's a it's a nudge in the direction of this is kind of bad for you or this might be bad for you, but it's definitely not like pushing you in any specific direction. But I think the analogy I liked the most about it was with the GPS, because it's it's a situation where I definitely find myself sometimes going along with the nudges of the GPS, the guidance that it's providing me. But if I happen to know better or make a different decision that I want to go a different way, there's nothing stopping me. Um, and I think that analogy really drives to the fact that this isn't manipulation per se, because I, I know that there was like it, we mentioned in the blurb there that skeptics kind of akin this to manipulation i think since it's got that positive spin at the end of it it kind of steers away from the manipulative aspect i don't know what are your thoughts nick well okay so i have a quick question for you before i jump into my thoughts did you go to that dark ux last week i did not man i'm really bummed that i missed it yeah because to me this almost feels like if there was such a thing light ux yeah, okay. I can agree with can that. Can you see that? Because I feel like this is sort of the light side equivalent. This is the Yoda equivalent of, you know, suggesting, but, you know, people still choose their own path. Um, so, I mean, it's like it's like pre- presenting you with the information that you need or, uh, you know, providing information that may be useful in a in a choice that you want to make. And it's usually in your best interest, but if you want to go and do something that you know you want to, you still have that freedom of choice. Yeah, and I think that that um, comparison is really good. The like the kind of light UX because all of these, or at least the ones that I saw in here, they really do. Are they're trying to get you to do something positive or lean towards that anyway? Um, but again, the uh, I can see how from maybe a science perspective you can call this a manipulation, but again, it's n- I feel like that ability to still have the choice to say no um, makes it a little bit different. I don't know. But what were your what are your thoughts? Just on this in general, I I don't know. I'm I'm a little so we've been doing this for a long time. And when it comes to the field of human factors, I I'm excited about this has already been integrated in policy and i'm i'm just excited now that we have this paper uh that that or or i guess it's not new right it's 2008 article it just won the nobel prize that's why it's in the news circuit but i i really like the fact that we are using psychology basically to influence human behavior in such a way that is uh beneficial to not only us but we're doing it subtly in a way that subverts our sort of perception. Um, and uh, only when it's brought to attention does it do, do people sort of realize what's going on. And I think there is a lot of responsibility that goes in with this, right? That like the um, they, they bring up the food nutrition labels. And I mean, there is a lot of debate about what is presented and in what uh, way is it presented? I mean, I, I, some of our listeners may notice that, it, at least in the states, some of the food no- labels have changed over the past couple years uh, to emphasize the calorie count as more important, depending on the current sort of information that we have. Now, whether or not that has an effect, we'll see. But uh, it's just these tiny little sort of changes um, that we're marginal or it's the marginal increments that are going to add up to something big i think yeah and i think the the big piece here for me is that it 
it nonetheless makes people more aware of the information they are being given. And it seems like in a lot of these instances they talk about, whether it be from health food or using specific policies for welfare or even like trying to get you to not smoke cigarettes, it's giving you information that I think is pertinent for you making a deci- a life decision, right? Like if, if cigarettes never said anything anywhere from the Surgeon General or now have those like gruesome pictures on them, I feel like you'd be getting a disservice not understanding the risk of what you're kind of ingesting into your body. And same thing with food. And I really like what you said, that it's interesting to see how much that's changed over the past few years, because as inf- as we get more information, like we have differences in how we need to present information to people about calories or the number of calories or the type of food that's in it or if it's processed or not processed. So. It's uh, I think overall this is good and it sounds like I mean this is from 2008 I feel like he's done a large body of work related to nudges um so it's it's a pretty cool line of thinking and I mean Kirk, congrats for the Nobel prize that's a serious achievement especially in psychology Yeah 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 no kidding uh I I would be curious to see uh how many Nobel prizes uh, let's see, I'm going to google it right now how many how many do you think there are Blake um I don't know, actually. 50? In psychology? Yeah, in psychology. Hmm. Let's see here. Uh, I am trying to find an answer to this. Uh, I, I can't, I don't see anything. I I really don't know. No no idea. Um, hang on. Why, uh, why don't you start to lead us into the next story, and I will see if I can get a special guest on the show to answer this question for us. Hey, sounds good. Oh, wait, right. hang on. Before you go, I think I have the special guest. She, yeah, she's on the line. Hang on. Uh, h- how many Nobel Prizes in psychology have been awarded? Oh, she, I, I don't think she wants to go. Hang on. Let me ask one more time here. How many Nobel Prizes in psychology have been awarded? Sorry. I'm not sure. Yep. All right. Didn't think so. That's Alexa, everybody. Oh, she was tired. Did Did you hear her on your end, Blake? There. I did not. Did she actually get us an answer? I don't know. I, we'll, we'll see. I've been uh, I'm messing around <laughs> with the cables as we're talking. All right. Next story. We got a lot. To, I, I'm messing around. We got so many stories to cover. Let's go. All right. Let's get it. Okay. So this is talking a little bit about research and driving. So research presented at the 2017 Australian Road Safety Conference has actually revealed that drivers aren't as cautious approaching a railway level crossing compared to a road intersection, despite the greater risk of fatality if a collision occurs. In fact, Dr. Gregory Laurie, Laurie's research indicated that drivers approach railway level crossings at significantly faster speeds than road intersections. Another key finding from his research was that drivers spend a lot less time assessing the situation at a railway cro- rail level crossing um, than they do at an intersection without traffic. So, Nick, I've got some thoughts about why this might be happening, but what do you think is going on here? So, I think what's going on is because users or no, drivers. Because drivers don't experience train crossings as frequently as they do as cross traffic from other uh, driver controlled vehicles or or autonomous vehicles if you're in Silicon Valley. Uh, I think that the lack of experience with uh, sort of these things, right? Like you, chances are if you're a driver, you've probably either witnessed a crash or um, can see a crash and relate to it heavily because they are more prevalent not in not only in the media that we consume but also in uh it's statistically more likely to happen and i think because trains and you run across train tracks less frequently than intersections um i feel like just because of the distribution i i feel like that is why drivers are kind of taking this le- less uh seriously than the normal intersections that's kind of my spin on it but i'm curious to see what you think Well, you'll be surprised to know, Nick, that I totally agree with you. What? I think that's that's exactly what's going on, (laughs) which is kind of funny because sometimes usually we have like diverging opinions. But no, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think people have more experience with the dangers that are associated with uh, the intersections, intersection traffic versus railroads. Um, And the other thing that I'm going to throw out there, and this is totally anecdotal, so please 
take it for what it is. But I've noticed here in San Diego, there's a couple of terrain tracks that go across that are no longer active. Yes. So I've gotten acclimated to that. And so I, I just pay them no mind. And actually, I found myself kind of continuing on that paying them no mind stretch when there actually was one. Now, there's also enough indicators of, you know, lights flashing, giant signs coming down, the sound of the train, the visual potentially of the train as well to kind of get you to stop. And I feel like in traffic, there's a lot more variables going around all at once. So maybe maybe that's a potential of why, too, um, is that there's clear warnings that are associated yeah. with a train stop. Um, but again, this is this was presented at the Australian conference. There could be different laws or they may not have the same, you know, alert methods, that kind of stuff. But I definitely agree with you. I think it's just experience. Yeah, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about driving later. But uh, I, I, do you have any other things to add on to this one? It's kind of just one of those, like, keep our listeners updated stories and then we'll move on. <laughs> Most definitely, yeah. I mean, there, there's... There's a couple specifics. Please read the story and tweet us about it or jump on our Slack and talk about it if you file on something extra interesting that we didn't get to talk about. Yeah, please do. We'll mention it on next week's show if you do uh, hang out with us on Slack. We're promoting that so heavily. but <laughs> We got to. All right. So uh, before we move on, though, I want to thank all of our friends over at uh, TechCrunch and Gadget, Science Daily, The Conversation, Gizmodo, and the University of Cambridge, and the Transportation Research Board for all our stories this week. We got a lot of we got a lot of friends this week. <laughs> if you guys want to follow along with these stories as we find them, uh, you can join us on our on our Slack. We post them there, or you can follow us on all the social media. We we post these as we find them. So uh, you know that that's that's where you want to be if you want to stay up to date and uh, kind of do your reading for the show. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, this one's pretty cool, Nick, because you and I talk a fair amount about AI on the show, and I like this spin on it that we've got. So Adobe has different motivations when it comes to building an AI platform. Unlike other companies such as Google or Amazon, Adobe claims that it has no interest in just building a general artificial intelligence platform. Instead, it wants to build a platform that focuses on helping its customers be more creative. It'll be integrating products like Sensei into its into its flagship platform tools. And Adobe actually stresses that all these tools are more about making the person creative than actually about making the machines more intelligent. I love this story because because a lot of our uh, time is spent um, sort of doing these mundane tasks, and uh, it sounds like what Adobe's trying to accomplish is to just kind of, um, you know, provide suggestions for uh, potential creative solutions. Uh, you know. And uh, it also. Well, Nick, do you mind if I hop in on this? Yeah, yeah, quick? please do. Help me out here. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about. Nick actually informed me there's a whole suite of tools that are being integrated or introduced, but I wanted to kind of give a little bit of my anecdotal experience with like Photoshop, right? Sure. So yeah. I'm not very versed in how to use Photoshop and it's, it's taken me a lot of hours of either reading books, watching videos and all that kind of stuff. And I'm still not the fastest workflow wise at it. And when I saw this description from their CTO, basically talking about that we're trying to see what the very best of the best of our community is doing in our separate flagship tools like Photoshop or maybe Adobe Premiere, and then translate that into helpful information for everybody. So it can kind of help you along with your workflow or be more creative or, hey, let me suggest this uh, kind of picture or this uh, like overlay to use for this particular design. I don't know. It's just a really awesome way that it sounds like Adobe has planned to integrate AI with creative work that people are doing. And I, I don't know, it gave me like a, a warm and fuzzy feeling about where AI is actually going to not take people's jobs, but make them more creative. Yeah, for sure. And I have to admit, this one was a little bit lower on my Adobe list, which is why I'm not as versed in it as you. But uh, to, uh, let's just so let's just take this opportunity to talk about all the stuff or some of the stuff that Adobe announced this week. I mean, one of our listeners in Slack after we posted this article said, you know, suggested that we that we talk about other things like the uh, VR AR um, uh, tools. And uh, there, there are other things too. So uh, I just, I just want to jump into a couple of these. So there is, um, so there's Adobe XD. Are you familiar with Adobe XD? 
You know, I just got the emails that it's come out of beta and now it's going into uh, like 1.0, so release version. So I have very limited experience. I got it when it came out in beta and, you know, I mean, it was it was good. I didn't mind it. I just had I think the problem for me was I had already built up kind of a repertoire and workflow and sketch. And so I didn't really feel the need to swap over and use the Adobe product. <laughs> Shia LaBeouf jumping into our podcast here. Uh, so, okay. So you, you liked it, but you didn't, you didn't think uh, it's sort of, but you had other tools. It's, it's, it's kind of that, that saying in statistics, it didn't go, it wasn't significantly different and beyond that. And like when you're talking about a re- regression, I mean, it was a good tool. I think if my like beginning workflow had been more based on Adobe products that I would fall in love with it a lot quicker. I was going to say, having said that this was a beta, um, that they, I'm sure gathered a lot of different information about. So they're going to be able to apply that to how to improve it, make it more robust. So it's one of those things that I'm, I'm keeping my eyes out for and will definitely continue to play with on my spare time. I just didn't feel like it was something that I was going to be like, oh, no more sketch. We're just doing XD. Right. Yeah. No, that was my main sort of uh, comment on XD was, um, you know, I know some designers who are very designers and coders who are very dependent on Adobe's uh, sort of ecosystem. They use Photoshop and especially Illustrator to make mockups and get this. Uh, I can't say for what reason, but they were developing an in-house piece of software that would basically do what Adobe XD kind of does. I think it's a little bit more robust, but uh, their their internal piece of software. But man, it, it's cool to see this sort of uh, ecosystem that talks to each other and, and works out. So let's jump into a couple other of these because I know we're running up on time. But uh, one other thing, so this, this one just personally to me... Um, did you see Project Cloak at all? Oh, uh, I did not. Which one is this? What's this one about? Uh, this one's number 10 here if you're looking at the article. Uh, so Project Cloak is uh, basically ma- it uses AI to remove tracked objects from um, uh, from video. So like if you have people walking behind the scenes in a full production movie, a lot of the CGI work nowadays is actually done on removing people from the shots. So you have this to take a lot of that, that work out of uh, the responsibility of the, the person that's doing all the editing, which I thought was cool. Not super human factories factors, but it kind of plays into that whole AI helping with um, workflow rather than taking jobs. Well, I don't know, man. I would actually argue that it is pretty human factors because <laughs> think about it. I mean, what what you just said is true. I mean, a lot of what's done in the editing room nowadays is a lot of cutting people out of shots. And now we with something like this can that can automatically do a lot of that for you or at least aid you in doing it. The best part about it is that it now allows somebody to sit there and be more creative about the editing process or the shots they're going to include or the music they're going to put in, if that makes any sense. It's, it's like removed a tedious step from their workflow and allows them to have you know, more breadth of what they can do in a single editing session. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, I like that answer. Uh, I'm going to keep <laughs> you around, Blake. <laughs> and then oh, uh, this last one, which is a little bit near and dear to me, uh, is uh, Project Soundscape. And this basically helps uh, VR and augmented reality filmmakers, so people who are producing videos in VR, understand how to best use sounds in their scene. Um, it kind of allows them to visualize where sounds are coming from while they're doing all these scenes. And, uh, um, you know, it's only a prototype now, but it'll be interesting to see uh, where it goes when it's uh, integrated into other tools like Adobe Premiere. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, I would love to see how it works and get like a sense of what that process is even like for people making AR and VR videos. I'm going to have to check this out after the show. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so we talked uh, Adobe to death. All right, what do we got up next? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so here's a little bit of here's a little bit for training your brain. All right, so John Hopkins University researchers found that one of two brain training methods most scientists use in their research is significantly better at improving memory and attention. In addition, it also results in significantly more brain activity. So these results from the studies suggest that the possible it's possible to train your brain similar to kind of how you would train other body parts in isolation. You use targeted workouts to make them stronger. So typically what's said of cognitive think training is it either works or it doesn't. 
And this research actually showed that what makes what matters is really the kind of training you're doing. So again, similar to the workout analogy there. Uh, the, the training paradigm they used was called the dual in-back task, which seems to show the most consistent results and the most impact on performance and should be one of the focuses of research if the goal is to improve cognition through training. Now, Nick and listeners, I apologize for stumbling through that one a little bit, but the in-back is a little confusing to me. Yeah, I was going to ask, what is the in-back? <laughs> is there an easy way we could break this down? Oh, my goodness. Well, the this blew me away because for any of our listeners, and Nick, if you if going through the article, I was like, are they ever going to tell me what the actual training exercises are? And they finally did, and I still didn't know what was going on. Um, yep. I know that I used the in-back task or performed it in a, like, a driving simulation study trying to, again, use it as a distractor task, but I had not heard of the dual version where I guess you were recalling audio, auditory and visual sequences that change. So that's interesting. So how does that differ from the regular in-back? Because I'm unfamiliar with it. Okay. I'm going to do my best. Please correct me, anybody who thinks that I'm, I am incorrect. I may not have this completely down. But basically, what I, from what I remember, it's an auditory or a visual task that you have to remember the sequence of. Now, what makes it hard and different from this this other task they use, which is called complex span, is that it's not just about remembering the sequence. It's about seeing a brand new sequence and remembering the one that's previous. Okay. Uh, so okay. let me let me back that up one more time, just for listeners. When I say the one that's previous, I mean the one that is in. So you have to go back and remember which sequence was whatever number. So whatever in. Um, and in this case, the dual part, and they make a good analogy. It's kind of like Simon. You have to remember the sounds and the colors um, all together. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of. Uh, that sounds that sounds really hard, and so so the idea here with this study is that if you do this enough, you're targeting that area of your brain, and or you're targeting a spe- targeting a specific area of the brain, um, specifically memory, right? Memory attention. Is that is that kind of uh, where the areas, and then uh, the the more they practice this, the better. Let's let's kind of walk through the methods here. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So one thing I just want to go ahead and talk about real quick is complex span. This was the second kind of training that people often use. Uh, and apparently this one's used just as much as dual in-back, so that's why they were testing it. So this just re- involves remembering a se- a number, <laughs> remembering items in a specific sequence. And there's kind of like a distractor task or item in the in the set that's supposed to throw you off of, okay, that is this one in the sequence? Is it not? So it's a little, it's not nearly as complicated and it's typically, typically in one modality, not both kind of like the dual. Um, but just talking a little bit about the method. So as you can probably guess, there's three groups of participants. We've got the ones that perform the in, the dual in back, those that performed a complex span task. And then we've got a control just as a baseline. So everyone took an initial battery of cognitive tests to determine a baseline of both your working memory, your attention, but also some intelligence uh, measures as well. And everybody had an EEG to measure just general brain activity uh, to understand like, okay, during these tasks, what's going on? How's their brain activating? Is it going to change over time? You know, giving some some nice comparisons for a baseline. Um, So then everyone everyone was sent home and they were to complete these tasks using their computer for five days a week for 30 minutes over the span of a month. So that's a lot of time to get people acclimated with this particular process. Right. Yeah. So so they're doing this for a month, uh, five days a week. Yeah. 30 minutes a day. Yeah. For 30 minutes a day. And that's kind of a long time. That is a lot. Yeah. So just kind just to really take it up a notch because this is how I thought about it, right? It makes a lot of sense that the dual in back is creating such differences in attention and memory and even brain activity, I would think. I get loose when I say those when I say the brain activity part because I feel like that's an extrapolation. But regardless, I mean we just talked about it. It's making your brain work really, really hard. And it, it's kind of like doing metabolic conditioning where you're doing a lot of exercises as quickly as you can 
in a small amount of time. Like you're, you're wearing your body out, making it do this physical activity. Um, and it's kind of the same in the brain, it sounds like, or at least that's, that's the analogy I see here. So uh, my next question is, uh, is this available online? Can we, can we get this? Well, that, that's the funny thing, Nick. I mean, I immediately thought of, I was like, well, it sounds like Luminosity or any app developers out there that tout that they have like brain neuroplasticity, uh, or, right? Yeah. Right. Like improvement software should be developing dual inback tasks for their specific applications, or at least that was what was in my head. Cause yeah. I mean, jumping to the results real quick, ju- they, the people that did this specific task for the 30 minutes for the month, every five days. I mean, they showed like a 30% improvement in their working memory. Now, what about... Excuse the, Oh, go ahead. Oh, anyway. And so that's... And they also like showed significant changes in their brain activity. Uh, mostly in the prefrontal cortex, right? Which is definitely... Uh, typically tends to... Or typically tends to be associated with higher levels typically. of learning. Yeah, you might not find that in, uh, <laughs> in some people. <laughs> so what happened in the complex band group? What happened with them? I am wondering if my notes are weird. So it says nearly double the gains made by the group. Okay, so that's that's what that's what I did. I did some silly note taking here. But anyway, so basically what happened is the people in the complex group only saw about like a almost 50% uh in comparison to the dual back group improvement. So maybe like a fi- 15. around a 15% improvement. Okay. All right. So but, but still nonetheless improvement, which is very right. interesting. Okay, so so yeah, we developed these dual in back apps that train you on a day to day basis. All right, so there's there's a business idea there. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, so okay, so obviously the dual in back is better. Um, that's that's awesome. Uh, what other sort of conclusions can you draw from this? Well, so okay, Nick, I've got a list of conclusions here, but I'm I actually going to th- I'm going to actually throw in a couple of my own. Yes, I would like do to it. see this continually researched. Like, if people did the in back task for a longer period of time, would they habituate to it, and would they stop seeing those um, these gains in memory and attention? And I know some of our listeners who have who are HF practitioners or psychologists are going to say, "Well, duh, that's going to happen." But I think it's kind of like doing functional workouts, right? At some point, you hit this plateau of like, okay, I've got, I've got to trick the body because I've done as much improvement as I possibly can with this regiment that I'm doing. Maybe in this, in this case, the in back, the dual in back task. But now I need to switch. Maybe I do the complex span for X amount of time. Kind of really trying to figure out what what companies like Luminosity or any of those other brain science people that have apps can do to really improve memory and attention. And I think this this would be a really interesting thing to apply to people with neurodegenerative diseases and see, do we see any differences? Are they able yeah. to perform them? Um, so that's kind of my take on it. That That's a great point uh, and one that I didn't think of. But yeah, it's... Yeah, it'll be C. It'll be uh, it'll be C. C. That's a Monday. God, I, I, <laughs> we'll see how this uh, sort of plays into other things outside of just the memory domain, and see how uh, you know other sort of uh, applications and training, especially. I think uh, could be really useful um, with some, or could could benefit from something like this. But I know we're bumping up on time. Uh, so why don't we move on to the next one? Because we got one, two, three, four more stories to cover, and we are about twenty minutes out. We might go long today, folks. So, all right, it's all good. So this one's uh, this one's pretty interesting to me because I just didn't really have a whole lot of background. So we're talking about the brain again, and this time researchers from Cambridge University have published new research that supports the selfish brain theory of human evolution. The research found that the human internal trade-off between physical and mental performance, when put in direct competition with, uh, put in direct competition, actually favored cognition taking less of a hit uh, in comparison to your your body or your skeletal or your muscles. So human brains are definitely expensive when we're ta- metabolically speaking, and it takes a lot of energy to run our sophisticated gray matter, and that often comes at an obviously evolutionary cost. But nonetheless, it appears from this line of research that a well-fueled brain may have offered better survival odds than well-fueled muscles when facing an environmental challenge. Nick, man, I don't know where your head at is on this one, but this 
honestly confused me. And I think I think it's trying to put a timeline together where this makes sense, because right off, like from the, a top level, I would assume that fueling the muscles is going to be more important. Let's say if you're running from the saber tooth tiger, right? Or right, but something but, like that. But what if the saber tooth tiger gives you math problems to solve like that? Then, I mean, this makes sense, right? Oh, then you're going to want that prefrontal cortex to be but real good. I will say, okay, so from that same thing, if you're looking at it from the evolutionary perspective, this to me makes total sense. Okay, think about it this way. Yeah, you are running from that saber-toothed tiger, but would you? I, I feel like humans would divert resources to their brain to find the most effective path, to find the most... Um, the, the path that's going to get them away from it, like up a tree or, um, you know, a cliff or zigzagging patterns or whatever's going to confuse them. I feel like that makes a, a ton of sense evolutionarily to me, right? If they are diverting this energy to the brain to think about how to uh, outsmart this thing, because that is one thing that we have over most other animals is that prefrontal cortex uh, and the ability to... to uh, think critically about things right yeah and i 100 percent agree with you man i mean i it's it was one of those things where i was trying to think about like why would it not be fueling the the muscles but you're right i that that change that we have at some point in the brain where we're able to solve problems more effectively it makes total sense that you're going to get a lot more energy or glucose in this case going to your brain um to kind of fuel you through these um these challenging environmental tasks. Uh, sure. So it's it it does make sense. I w- I was trying to play a little bit devil's advocate here and hopefully figure out a different point. But honestly, as far as you're right, I mean, you could if you gave all the glucose to the muscles and you could run forever, cool. But it might be better if you could figure out like a creative solution to actually get you out of that versus just a physical one. And I mean, okay, think about like weight training too. You spend more effort in your mind trying to keep your form solid, right? At least when you're learning how to weight train, right? When you're doing squats, you want to make sure you're keeping everything exactly where it needs to be because if you get taught wrong and you do it later, then you're going to mess something up. So it it makes sense that you, you know, like at least for me, and that's from my experience, when I started weight training, like I, I paid more attention to what was going on with my body, uh, but I was using my brain for that rather than my muscles to, to like I would just do light, wait because i knew i wouldn't be able to do both i don't know it just makes sense to me oh 100 percent, man do you do we have time to break down the method a little bit for everybody we can do the short version i'll run through it so they either did uh so there was an isolated power test where they rode uh rode in a boat uh for three minutes uh and their average wattage was recorded then they did a uh free recall test in an isolated recall test and this uh this is where they were shown 75 words um in a three minute period and then they they had to recall as many words as possible and then they did a combined trade-off test where they did both uh with a different word set um i'm trying to think if there's anything else worth noting here those are kind of the quick and dirty methods there yeah, and, and just to like wrap it back to the to what we said earlier, what they found was basically that the the task that was much more mentally intensive seemed they seemed to perform they performed better when they were having to do this combined trade off task versus like only focusing on that physical motion task. Uh, so yeah. it, it's pretty it's a pretty cool way to test it. Um, I. <laughs> I, I wonder if there was people experienced rowing or not. And I don't know. I would like to dig more into the data, but that's for another day. Yeah, for sure. And uh, follow ups, follow up study is to see what different tests do to them and to what degree. Um, OK, let's go ahead and get into this next story. This one I am a little excited about. Very cool. All right, here we go. So the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety has released a report that examines how in-vehicle infotainment systems in 2017 model year vehicles impacts a driver's workload. This is going to be a super interesting one. So the researchers investigated which types of 
which task types are most distracting and what are the sources of distraction being either visual, manual versus like a cognitive distraction. They also looked at what is the workload associated with different modes of infotainment systems. So if it is in the center stack, is it an auditory interaction? Is it in center console? Uh, and then what are the bases for any differences in workload associated with the use of these different stacks? So Nick, you were stoked on this one. Let's let's break it down. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to go over the quick and dirty of these because we still got what two more stories after this. So they're short stories, but I want to make sure we get to them this week. So uh, let's see here. The quick and dirty. They basically found that task types differed in terms of visual and cognitive demand, right? So with the audio stuff, um, it's equivalent to sort of calling and dialing on your cell phone. So if you were to talk to your interface, that's what they're talking about there. It's about the same as calling someone. Uh, Text messaging uh, was associated with a higher level of demand than the other tasks. And uh, the most demanding was something like... um, um, uh, entering a destination, right? And and it, ho- it had an overall demand that was more than two times of that of the uh, high demand referent. So there's a lot going on when you're trying to enter a destination, which makes sense because you're trying to put in not only um, numbers and words, but you're trying to find a destination if you don't know where you're going. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, and we can we can break these down after I go over all of them, Blake. Uh, so so pick out any points that you want to talk about. So the, sure. we're talking about over, overall workload now. Or should we we can break down the uh, the task types. Do you have anything to comment on the task types there? Yeah, I mean, uh, kind of a, a weird comment. <laughs> so this really mirrors a lot of the stuff that I remember learning in grad school in an attention class. Because we actually, we focused heavily on this driving and interacting with your phone and the infotainment stuff. Uh, for the weird one, or the... I guess the thing I'm having a little bit of a problem with is this last one, because I, I totally get it. I mean, even in relation to text messaging, you'd probably be better off text messaging than trying to type something into a navigation system because you're not as familiar maybe with the fields, the things you're putting in, blah, blah, blah. But the the thing here that I'm wondering about is like, well, did they see a difference when they used kind of a voice activated navigation system deal and what that comparison looks like? Because I feel... I felt like voice was really going to come out on top in this, but it doesn't seem like that was the case. So you're talking about uh, the difference between inputting something with um, with uh, b- 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 voice versus like typing. Yeah, because I mean, okay. we can obviously understand that there, the typing it in manually is going to be much more demanding. So I think um, this is just the overall results, just based on task. Uh, I don't think we're breaking down. Uh, method of entry yet i think that one comes next so well all right that's a, ahead of myself that's a good segue so we're looking at workload now in in terms of each mode of interaction um so uh so using voice-based commands what we were just talking about to control these functions resulted in lower levels of visual demand than the reference tax that makes sense right you're not using your visual system to to mess with any of this the um the benefits of reduced visual demand were offset by longer interaction times so it took longer for them to interact with them auditorily or orally interesting uh, yeah wow. and then uh auditory vocal interactions took longer than yeah that's the point i just made um yeah and they they took longer but it sounds like there was less uh less visual demand diverted which, which i mean that makes a lot of sense uh I would. Wa- this is one of those where I would want to know more because I, I, I don't know, Nick. Am I being insane? That sounds pretty intuitive, right? Like if you're if you're no longer having to do something visually with your or manually, and you're freeing it up by just doing it through voice commands. Of course, you're going to have less visual demand. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's this is the the quick and dirty of the report. If you want to dig into the full thing, we posted it on our story. So it's the Traffic Research Board article. So. Um, I'm going to jump into the next one here for the analysis. Uh, they found surprisingly large differences between vehicles in terms of the overall demand. So uh, seven of the 30 vehicles that they looked at received an overall rating significantly bo- below 1.0. Uh, and I'll go over what this means in a sec. 11 of the 30 vehicles received a score that did not differ from the high demand referent. 
and then 12 of the 30 so scored significantly above the high demand reference. So the high demand referent was basically a task, uh, in terms of my understanding, as, so far as my understanding goes, is, is a task that they did as sort of a control, right, where they, they had them do a task, and it was very h highly demanding. And it looks like by vehicle, uh, by count of vehicle, uh, more than half, only seven, uh, came in under the moderate level of demand. So I, I'm curious to see which which models those are and and what the methods of interaction were. But uh, unfortunately, I just have the the quick and dirty right now. Oh, when maybe gotcha. maybe some of our listeners jump in. I want to jump into this next one here right away too. The vast majority of the features and functions in the vehicle uh, evaluated were unrelated to the task of driving so uh, or in the case of destination entry it could have been done before the vehicle was in motion so all these tasks are stuff that doesn't interfere with their driving task um, and a lot of them had uh, cumbersome HMIs human machine interfaces with design inconsistencies that led to high levels of workload um, many interactions were associated with high levels of uh, cognitive and visual demand with long interaction times uh, and a quick example is 83% of the vehicles with a high, with, with a very high overall demand offered destination entry for navigation while the vehicle was in motion. Um, and that, that was a task that was found to produce high levels of workload. So you can kind of see why there's such an inflated number of, um, the, uh, the, the, the scores above the, the control basically. So uh, but those are the quick and dirty of the Traffic Research Board. Blake, do you have any other thoughts on that one before we jump in? To uh, kind story? of the only one that I, f I really wanted to hammer on was the differences between all the vehicles. And I totally see that because I, I don't know. I've hopped in so many different cars from so many years. But even in the 2017 models, it, it, they're all so very different. And I feel like this kind of study or this kind of information could be really, really useful to them because I'm. I, I don't know, though, because we're, we're talking about at some point autonomous cars are going to kind of take over the sphere of things. But I think this kind of information is helpful because it may be at some point something people take into account when they're buying a car is like, well, how how difficult is, to, is it to use the infotainment system when I'm driving? Can I see the numbers, please? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the biggest takeaway I have. Uh, everything else seems seems pretty standard, to be completely honest. I mean, it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense. Uh, I think this is just a very important outlet for the research to be put in yeah for sure all right let's jump into this uh so we had two more stories so we're going to bump one to next week just because it doesn't really relate to anything we're talking about and i posted it yesterday so it's fine uh wh what's up next what's our last story of the week all right so let's let's kick this one off so a new study following police officers in washington dc has found no evidence that body cameras reduce allegations of police misconduct or officer use of force more than 2,000 officer, officers participated in the study, making it the largest of its kind in the U.S., tracked over several months in the Metropolitan Police Department. Officers with body cameras received the same number of complaints as those with, without them and reported using force as often. Ultimately, the study concluded that police departments should, quote, should not expect dramatic reductions in the use of force or complaints or other large scale shifts in behavior solely from the deployment of this technology. And you know, Nick, I totally agree with that, that last statement. Um, that, I don't know. I, I definitely get the implementation of the technology and people's like hopes that, Oh, this is going to change everything. But I mean, you did a really good job of breaking down. I think it was Ronald Davis's yeah. talk and his experience, both as an African American and a police officer and that it's it's not going to be localized or fixed by a technology solution. It's a change in overall organization. And that's that's one thing that I really wanted to point out when I was writing this the other day was that, I mean, it's great that they did such a large sample size and to get right. like a pretty meaningful um, a pretty meaningful result. But the thing is, this is localized to one specific place and one type of organizational structure because as we found from your breakdown of hfes like there's there's no central structure for organizing these kind of enforcement departments yeah and i want to bring up one so the reason i i even pulled this article uh was because there there was one thing that ronald davis said that kind of stuck with me as i saw this headline 
And I was like, oh, wow, that's that fits perfectly and, and is a perfect transition from last week. He was saying that systems are working as intended. So all the racism that's ingrained in the 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 policy, um, you know, it's 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 working. And all this high tech computer stuff, this this uh these body cameras, they're just an add-on to the system, but it's not a change, right? And this really kind of brings to light, oh, this is not doing anything, and you know, it's a policy that we need to change instead of uh, just the, the technology to, you know, it's not the technology that's going to change it, it's the policy. So that was one of the reasons why I brought it up. Now, I want to make sure we get to this uh, listener email before we call it today. We're, yes, we're uh, we're bumping up against time. But Quinn wrote in. So thanks for writing in, Quinn. He writes, uh, hey, guys, I recently found your cast as I recently discovered human factors and I'm looking to hopefully get into the field one day soon. I'm not sure if you have done a cast on this one, uh, but could you do one on how to get into human factors? Well, we're not going to do a whole episode, but we will sure be sure to answer your question. Uh, and he writes, especially post college. Uh, he graduated last year with his bachelor's in psych, and I didn't know what to, I didn't know about human factors until after I graduated. Couldn't find a whole lot on the web on how to get in. I also thought it'd be helpful to hear from you guys. Thanks, and that's from Quinn. So thanks again for writing in, Quinn Blake. I see you got a big long answer prepared for this one. Uh, yeah, and I'm gonna try and keep it as high level. Um, the first thing I'm gonna say, I want people to take it with a grain of salt because I genuinely do mean it. If I was you, I would. I would consider hopping in our Slack just because there's a lot of different kinds of people that have experience in different realms of psychology related to human factors that might be able to give you good guidance too. So definitely check that out if that's something you're up for. But the biggest thing that helped me, because I've talked about this before, I was in your same situation. I graduated with a BS, very end of graduation, realized like, oh, what's this human factors thing? That sounds cool. Um, so the first suggestion is graduate school an option because uh, like you, I didn't get a undergraduate degree in human factors. I know those are offered a lot more available now. So that was, that's something I would say I would look for, like try and apply to a graduate school, get in a program. Um, cause that'll really give you a solid basis in the methods, psychology, even some research experience. Um, this, this next one, uh, I would say join HFES international and also find out if you've got a local chapter in your city. If you don't, Start, start one 100% like start I don't know I've heard this a bunch of times the best way to get mentors or learn more something more about a topic is to create a forum where people can come and talk about it um, so if again if grad school is not particularly an option still look for student HFES chapters and go volunteer your time with the organization if you can um, also Nick just came back from HFES that is a perfect place to uh, to, to try and go or different there's different kinds of conferences related to human factors throughout the year around the world so seek those out they are expensive but they are just undeniable great networking opportunities 100 percent worth it yeah um this one is a little harder i will admit but look for an hf internship look for something that's that sounds like it you could spin into the human factors realm to learn more or try and apply what maybe you're reading online or reading anywhere um and then this, I'm going to make two last points, and I swear I'm done. So think about a domain that you would really like to apply the human factor skills that you want to and kind of dive into that. So like if it's, if it's healthcare, for example, like really go out, check out research that's related to that specific field, because I think the more that you read that, you're going to pick up on subtle little things that all these people are doing, and that's going to help build your skill set. Um, regardless of whether you're actually going to grad school or if you're just reading research on, our, on your own. Again, HFES International, great place for that. Um, da, da, da. This is one thing that I've started picking up uh, with regards to something completely different, but I still want to throw it out there. If you really want to learn something better, I encourage you to try and teach it to somebody. So if you, there's an HFES group or if you start the meetup, do talks on human factors methodology, do talks on human factors and then in, in uh, healthcare or any other kinds of um, applications of it. Just, just get out there and try and tell people about it. Yeah, that all sounds good. And I, I so yes, uh, all that sounds good. Join us on Slack, join one of those local chapters. Blake, you kind of covered it all. I mean, my only other uh, sort of piece of advice to this one would be, um, you know, what did you do in your undergrad psych? But I'm sure you worked in labs. I'm sure you you have some experience. 
it really is all about how you spin your experience, right? So if you have done uh, work with human participants, you can apply to a user researcher position that says, hey, look, I know how to run scientific studies. I've done, I've, I've at least uh, had experience in this area, right? Um, and sure, it's applied to a different domain, but don't downplay what you are comfortable in. Uh, and that's that's one good way of transitioning to a field, especially in a research position. Uh, you're doing a lot of um, you're doing a lot of human research in human factors, and so it it also depends on how involved or, or or what career path you want. Are you looking for something uh, more in human factors? Are you looking for something more in ergonomics? Because there's a little bit of a difference there, and I can see where the gap might be a little bit bigger. But please, please, please reach out to us if we haven't clarified this for you, and uh, we can we can hopefully clarify some of that for you and and uh, jump in our Slack and and you know we'll be happy to talk with you. But Blake, I think I think we got to be done. <laughs> All right, man. Well, let's let's call the night then. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of our stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. Head on over to our Human Factors cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can always join the discussion on our Slack. Like I said, the link can be found in our show notes on uh, SoundCloud, that website, and our website. Uh, so uh, leave us a comment over there on our SoundCloud or send us an email at uh, humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, even better than an email, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing and want to support us financially, you can support us on Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for hanging out with me tonight and breaking down all of the news stories this week. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk more about uh, methods in terms of uh, rowing? (laughs) Oh, man. Well, Nick, thank you for grabbing such great stories this week. I really appreciate you having me on just like every week. If you guys want to chat with me a little more, of course, you can reach me in Slack. You can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Or, yeah, it's about the only two places you can find me right now. (laughs) Um, So please reach out to me. I'd love to answer your questions. Quinn, if you want more information, reach out to me in any way that you need to. I would love to have a more intensive dialogue. But everybody, enjoy your Monday night, and thanks for listening to Human Factors Cast. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next week, it depends. Oh, it depends on what's on next week. Oh, what is next week? drones probably some other stuff that we can't see because we're not clairvoyant oh that's right we've already got one story yeah sing along to the music